Hi everybody, this is Jen. We're going to do something a little bit different today. You're going to get to see me in person and this little lizard guy in person. He is a bearded dragon. And there's another person on this call with me. That's Michael Tim. He's a freelance writer. Um, he is constantly surrounded by words. He does game design and all kinds of different cool things. And for this superhero alert, I wanted to talk with you guys um, about, actually I wanted to let him talk with you guys about how he's using game design um, and app design to make the world a better place. <laughs> I'm, I'm flattered uh, to be on to be profiled here it's uh it's an honor it's been fun reading some of your work discovering it online and uh so it was it was really neat when you invited me to to chat um i'm in milwaukee wisconsin uh which is uh tagline used to be a great city on a great lake or a great place on a great lake and uh we have a, a lot of identity with lake michigan which is source of our drinking water and as well as um, just a big part of what the culture is mm. um, and the history of the city. And I, um, what I'm up to now is uh, an app called Water Story Milwaukee, which is, the way we pitch it is kind of like Pokemon Go for water stories. Um, so we rolled out the pilot this summer, uh, we being Reflow Sustainable Water Solutions, which is a nonprofit in Milwaukee that um, works with green infrastructure and supports community green infrastructure, green infrastructure being uh, infiltrating water that comes from rain and storms on site, reusing it, uh, could be rainwater harvesting, could be uh, just storing it so that it's not overwhelming the sewer system. And so the nonprofit is an interest in connecting green infrastructure with schools and both public and private uh, properties. And where I came in was initially as a volunteer helping on some of these projects, uh, but with a background in water science uh, and journalism, really interested in engaging the general public about what our hidden water stories are. And so about two years ago, we had a, a thought of how we could use, um, how we could make a, an app that would uh, help to do this. And this was before Pokemon Go came out, but uh, it helps to tell the story about what we're up to by saying it's like Pokemon Go for water stories in Milwaukee, <laughs> uh, because people kind of get that, they've heard of that. Um, the, all the water that falls on this uh, urban farm site uh, drains into two bioswales and then from there into an underground cistern, which uh, my colleague likes to compare to the size of two city buses. So you can imagine wow. these two city buses of storage capacity underground, uh, and that's all water that's being held before it goes into the sewer system. But if you'd walk by it, you wouldn't see it because it's underground. And so the app uh, allows an opportunity for this uh, education and engagement of Hmm, what's buried beneath the ground here that is actually um, a community-powered um, cistern because there was a lot of volunteers that came together to put that system together. Um, wow. So they, they helped to make it. And that's one of the examples of the water stories that are, I like to call, hidden in plain sight. Uh, yeah. We, um, we shared the app uh, in an event we called the Great Water Race this summer uh, in July 2017 where a number of different teams kind of raced across the city to experience all this content for the first time. They had a lot of fun, they had some great prizes, um, and they explored everything from that urban farm to uh, historic breweries to uh, uh, green infrastructure down at one of our popular beaches. So uh, it was, yes. it was it's kind of a way to stitch together the things that we value about the city and about how water interrelates with the city within the practices and the best practices of people and we can do individually and collectively to... Um, uh, to improve water quality and reduce uh, reduce sewage overflows, reduce basement backups, and then keep the water that we're drinking clean. Um, wow, that's awesome! Because you're kind of marrying then history and a histor and like a maintaining the heritage of the city too, along with the environmental awareness. It's kind of like you're taking past and future and putting them putting the putting them together actually in that experience. How um. Was it was it difficult to like write the app and and I mean, how does app writing work? Sure. So for the pilot, we used a, a platform called Tailblazer, which was actually uh, developed out of MIT, and it's kind of a real cool thing that allows you to build your own place-based apps. Um, and so we use their platform, which anyone can can Google Tailblazer. It's T A L E. A blazer um, and play around with it and see what might be applicable to their context and just to kind of prove that it could be done and to, to showcase a lot of the media content that we generated with interviews um, with a number of different folks and these kind of mini games 
uh, we use that. We're working now uh, with uh, an entity called Watermarks, uh, who is uh, a New York-based artist, Mary Miss, and her team. Uh, we're interested in collaborating over the next year to do a bigger and better kind of independent app where you can oh. go um, and find it in the app store directly rather than going through Tailblazer. But the yeah. how of it was Tailblazer. Um, there was a couple. Is that of, is that a free, is that free software? It is. Like, is that something that any of like our listeners could like try to? It is uh, use to make their own things. It is. It's kind of cool that way. So again, it's Tailblazer. Give them a little commercial here. Um, oh, it, awesome! MIT uh, Step Lab is is actually who developed it, and they had an NSF grant a few years ago that uh, made that happen. But um, we found out about it uh, through a different platform that I was using initially called Aris, A-R-I-S, which also uh, allows you to make your own place-based games. Uh, they both have different affordances. Um, they were based out of Madison, so I learned about them first because I'm in Milwaukee. And in 2015, um, after a, a short water film festival that I had put on at a local theater, um, uh, a colleague of mine recommended when she saw that I was working on this uh, cooperative board game about the muscle invasion of the Great Lakes, which is called Muscle Madness. She said, oh, you yes. got to talk to these people in Madison. Um, there's, there's somebody I want you to meet there because she's working on these app games and things. So I, I had a conversation with, with them. I discovered um, that this platform called Eris existed. I, I went down the rabbit hole of what was then called the Games Learning Society Conference, which was a conference that was held for 12 years in Madison uh, until the um, the parties that organized it left for, for greener pastures in California due to um, changes in the Wisconsin State Legislature and how they funded the university system. Um, so 2016 was actually the last year of that conference. Um, I went there for two years and kind of discovered there's this whole intersection between games, educators, and then games and education research, uh, which yes. was really, really fascinating to me. I really felt like I found kind of like my tribe, quote unquote. Um, and because it's, these are kind of hybrid people in this hybrid space who are working for um, uh, the betterment of our communities in various ways. So I discovered that there was the possibility to do this, talked to my colleague at Reflow about it, who was really excited about mapping and about community engagement, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So we wrote a couple mm. of grants to support my time, uh, and then we used mm. the tools that were available to pull this together. Um, so it, I, I would say that it is it can be done. Um, there's there's free tools out there. Um, there are a number of pieces that come together to to make it kind of all one polished piece. Do you have any suggestions on grant writing for people um, who want to basically kind of learn how to do the kind of those out of the box things? Like usually when we think about grants, right? We think about somebody asking for it for like they're going to write a scientific paper and they have a research. Uh, you know, some kind of experiment running or something like that. But can you kind of explain to listeners how they can, um, or like what are good sources or search engines to find grants that they can <clears throat> use for like doing good kind of, kind of just general do good activities? Yeah, it, it's going to be sort of dependent on the geography and also the theme of how they're doing good. So for mm -hmm. us, um, we, we were able to tap into some of the folks who are um, supporting community water initiatives uh, in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. uh, we were funded through uh, partly through a um, what's called a Sweetwater grant in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So there's an entity called Sweetwater Trust, Southeastern Wisconsin's Watershed Trust, which is interested in supporting community efforts to improve our waters and education about our waters. Um, and so they were part, partial support. It was just a mini grant. And then uh, it was a little bit outside their ken, and they experimented with us, but Wisconsin Humanities Council was another source for us um, oh. because of the digital humanities component. Uh, and as you yeah. mentioned, the, the history is really important to this. Um, it, it isn't that we're purely like flagging projects that Reflow has done. These aren't Reflow projects per se. It's really about the culture of how to relate with water in the city. And that, as you were pointing out, mm -hmm. goes both past and, and future. And so the ability to kind of annotate um, a brewery and how that has changed over the past century. And at the Paps mm. Brewery, once the largest in the world in terms of production, uh, and now uh, had sat derelict for a number of decades, uh, and then now is being sort of re-energized as its own green neighborhood, which has been LEED certified um, uh, and recognized uh, globally as this sort of way to redevelop um, properties without 
damaging the historical character, but yet integrating um, uh, stormwater management into design and uh, housing for international mm-hmm. students and working with universities and also working with businesses. So there, it's, it's this great story to share in the core of our city, um, something that not everyone was aware of. Um, and the history is really important there. So we worked with a photographer who'd done a, 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 um, a photo book on the Paps Brewery, and uh, he was a great mm-hmm. about um, kind of annotating uh, some some of the stories uh, as you journey through the, the Paps neighborhood. But maybe so, folks out there yeah. familiar with Paps Blue Ribbon Beer? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. It depends on probably. the age range. We have we have some who are sure. a little young. We shouldn't be familiar ah. with it yet, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, that's awesome. So what's kind of your big, um, so obviously games have the ability to attract us to new information because of the dopamine release in ways that just like reading or other things don't. Um, so what's been kind of the main thing that you hope to motivate your, um, cause you talked about you're teaching through the game. You've been teaching some different like sustainable behaviors. What are some of the sustainable behaviors um, as far as water that you can kind of tell our readers about or our listeners since they're listening um, as far as good water, good water behavior. Talk to me about water hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> water hygiene. I like that. Um, so that's also going to be sort of geographic dependent in the Midwest. Mm. Uh, one of the and in urban environments in the Midwest, one of the things we're concerned about is stormwater management. So the sort of the the heart be, the motivation behind the app is to help normalize green infrastructure, and that can take a number mm. of different forms. Um, and when I, that sounds kind of uh, high up there, normalize. What does that mean? Well, just to make put it in our consciousness and make people feel like this is a something that they can do and that it isn't this extreme thing that's uncomfortable or that it's hard to do. Um, so we highlight things like rain gardens. So rain garden at its most basic is a, is a depression that you dig into the ground, you plant with native plants, and then you route water that would be draining over land surface to that so that the plants are doing the work of decontaminating the, the whatever would be in the water. Um, and it's not going immediately into your sewer system. Um, so in, in older urban areas, such as much of the country, including Milwaukee, um, mm. they get really hard and armored over. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a tendency to, to, to shield the riverbanks to increase the flow of water to, to reduce flood risk. But then what that did was you just had these what they call super critical flows, people were drowning in them, etc. And it's really bad for water quality because you get these flash, uh, like these flash, flash uh, flood surges through these um, yes. concrete armored uh, riverways. And yes. there's no place, for, there's no habitat for aquatic life. Um, so you're kind of teaching a city to forget its water. Um, mm. A lot of efforts recently, you talk about water hygiene, it's sort of, um, it's sort of even bigger than that in terms of like the consciousness raising that we have water in our environment. It's part of it. So bringing people to be aware that there's a river there in Milwaukee, we have three rivers that are kind of converging in the city and historically, um, depending on what phase of history you're looking at, they were, they were treated as open sewers. Um, they were treated as, um, uh, as liabilities rather than assets. The past couple decades, there's been a turnaround in that, and so mm. to be able to show how that has changed is part of the consciousness raising that we're interested in doing. When it comes to your individual water hygiene, that collective action has made a difference. Back in yeah. the late 1800s in Milwaukee, there was talk about paving over the rivers because they smelled so bad from industrial waste, from tanneries and, and other sources. So there was this Ooh. idea that we want to get away from this, this is horrible. And then what they yes. did was they engineered a solution they cut a, a half mile tunnel from one of our sites, which is now a coffee shop uh, down by the lakefront, which is a pumping station built in 1888, the, the lar- then the largest pump in the world for water, um, and routed clean Lake Michigan water a half mile underground to flush out the river, kind of like a giant, giant toilet tank, as one of our local historians likes to say. So this was this huge public works project to solve this collective problem, and that's how we solved it in 1888, was by flushing it downstream. Now yes. the, the attitudes have, have changed such that we're recognizing that we can all make this sort of cumulative difference, and that's what 
sort of the largest story of green infrastructure is meant to be about. So whether you have a 55-gallon rain barrel on your property that is intercepting some of the stormwater off your roof, or whether you've planted a rain garden, or whether you're just conscious about like when you flush the toilet or when you do the laundry, or if you're aware now that you're near a river and that that's an asset rather than just a liability, we've done a little bit of our job to kind of to raise that consciousness and then direct people to resources about how they can become part of that solution. Um, so yes. it's not just a one one, there's not a silver bullet here, um, but we really believe, you're talking about dopamine release, I, I like that you mentioned that. Um, is there's been, there's what I like to call like a water choir here of, there's different nonprofit actors who have a mission and they go at it and they do really well. But as with any area, there's a lot of siloage, so you're not always mm. crossing that usual choir boundary. We really feel like this game methodology can get people who aren't part of that choir to have an understanding of how they fit. Uh, and yes. early results are really encouraging because we've had folks um, from outside of the city who have never been in Milwaukee before, very seldom, and they like kind of discovered parts of the city through the app, which is really rewarding. We've had young people who didn't weren't aware of some of the stories of how the buildings have changed or where where there was a riverfront park, just become aware of that. Um, and I and so anecdotally, there, it's been really really um, meaningful. Uh, and, th and that's where we're going. We're trying to make people recognize the assets and share their own stories such that they'll be motivated to take the kind of the action steps um, that the partners are interested in. Uh, and that, so I, that's a kind of a roundabout way of addressing, if not answering your question. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing, too, that's always interesting when you're because, you know, when you do games, game design, usually you have like a period of game testing and then you have the game creation. Um, then you have game testing after the game. Um, but with this kind of game, it's almost like you could do another round of testing where you, um, basically like test efficacy. Like you could almost do a study where you try to interpret how many, you know, how did it change people's behaviors? How many people who downloaded the app then started using this much water? Like you could even get city records of like water usage in different homes or like rain gardens. And it's, it's the, the possibilities for, I guess process improvement with something like this are just endless, which that is going a little bit more technical and above the scope of this interview. But it's yeah. it's fascinating to think about how games can be, basically games can be used to not just make um, conscious changes, but to eventually, I think, make measurable changes. Now, I know you were talking about these were like anecdotes, but I, I suspect you could probably do, you know, some somebody, some scientist could get a, get, get a grant, right? You yeah, you'd want a good experimental econ uh, economist to do this. And uh, I was briefly involved with someone like that um, before I started working with Reflow. And so I, I, I get the drift of what you're saying, and I agree. One of the things we want to do long term with this is kind of crowdsource uh, green infrastructure documentation. So where yes. are the rain barrels? questions and there's there's interest in like having this baseline of understanding of where is all the stuff so we can know if we're making a difference as we apply money here and money there and projects here and projects there and there isn't right now and we're working in, in different arenas to try to address these questions there isn't a yeah. great comprehensive sense right now and one of the uncertainties is the residential uptake to, to use yeah. big words again I mean like how are private property owners who are you know they're not uh, an institution, they're not a business, how are they modifying their land use practices that might make a difference? And yes. you could imagine, I floated the idea and we, we'll see if we can build something like this using the app game uh, of like a co-optition between different uh, motivated communities. So there's yes. a lot of festivals in Milwaukee. Um, there's a lot of local like street and neighborhood level festivals. And so what, yes. I've, what I thought would be cool is if you have two neighborhoods and you put out a challenge like, okay, go out and uh, document all the rain barrels in your in this area, you know, like and come back and then whoever wins gets uh, the the incentive is like you'll have a mini grant to support another bigger piece of green infrastructure somewhere. But then you get the bragging rights of this, and all of a sudden yes. you're getting this on the radar as part of like a community cultural process rather than just um, okay, I've done it once and I'm kind of done with that. So we're we're looking at this as sort of the ground floor and moving forward with lots of different ways to use as you're suggesting, gameplay to motivate behavior. Not necessarily yes. that it's a, a game that you're going to go out and play just as a game, but as something that um, uh, that that stitches you part of your community, but then we can we can do 
you can do push push notifications of different challenges to say like, okay, mm. here's a new challenge. Did you discover this corner of the city? And what about documenting where this is or finding that? So we're I I don't have the the answer for you, but I I agree with the line of suggestions that you've put out. Well, I, it's so interesting because I think somebody who's always thinking like you are, like you're thinking of new solutions and thinking of new ideas, um, but also evaluating, I think is an important part of, since this is called a superhero alert, right? Uh, it's an important part of how <laughs> doing good works, right? Is that you evaluate, hey, how can I do even better? And I think that's something, you, It's it sounds really awesome what you're doing. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the muscles game. Um, shifting gears a little bit because didn't you win like a Pulitzer or something for your journalism? Oh no 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 Pulitzer no the. the uh, so I saw you won some award for your we, journalism yeah, yeah. on the invasive mussels. Um, I I won a journalism award for a story I did on Sweetwater Organics in 2012, which was a uh, an urban aquaculture facility um, that um, that had sort of failed um, and so we we had the challenge of, of documenting that story everyone really wanted it to succeed but for a number of reasons um, it, it didn't so that because of the investigative reporting I was awarded on that front you oh, may have okay. uh, a, it was a game recognition for a, a hackathon game a couple years ago that I and a number of others did through the um, climate game challenge our game, a game jam. So NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the White House uh, Office of Technology and Policy, I believe that's the right acronym, um, put out a challenge to people around the country back in October 2015 of, hey, can you guys develop educational games about climate change? And so I was part of a group that took 48 hours over a weekend to kind of brainstorm together a, uh, a game. Uh, we call it Three mm -hmm. Degrees. It was... Um, uh, it has not been fully actualized, but it won second place nationally in that adult category. So that was pretty encouraging. Um, we based it off of the the game mechanics of Pandemic, which if there's game oh. geeks, out there, yeah. one of these games. So it was really targeting like uh, motivated high school students who might want to participate in this kind of thing where over a hundred years you're trying to ratchet down your carbon but yet you've got internal motivations that are challenging you against that so <laughs> how, does, how do you how do you by 2100 um you know achieve <laughs> not raising the planet's temperature by three degrees uh centigrade so that may have been what you saw with an award muscle madness um uh was really a passion project and supported by a community uh through kickstarter and i'm, I'm really thrilled with it, how how it's it's come about uh, it's a cooperative board game about the Great Lakes, and um, it's really meant for kids, but I find that adults enjoy playing it as well. Um, this was a brainstorm that came about um, through lots of different pathways, <laughs> uh, but in 2011, I had uh, written and directed an interactive murder mystery play in Milwaukee, and we had great fun with that, and I was really inspired or encouraged by how people kind of opened up when I walked around during that experience and saw them kind of being a part of it. And I thought, well, I sh we should be able to use that kind of methodology ch towards like these larger social and, e and environmental problems. Like why, why should entertainment when it's really opening us up to possibilities uh, be limited just to entertainment. And so that was kind of the, one of the Genesis moments of this, uh, what became a, a board game where you play as one of the Great Lakes and you get invaded by invasive mussels, M-U-S-S-E-L-S. -S -S. Uh -oh. And this this is based in reality. This has really happened um, where uh, because of international shipping where um, species have come through in the ballast water of our uh, ocean-going vessels that come into the Great Lakes, um, that's been a, a vector for invasive species, species that aren't from uh, the area and that do really well in their new niche and then they take over to the exclusion of, of uh, native species uh, and, the, and change the dynamics. Um, quagga and zebra mussels kind of have carpeted the bottom of the Great Lakes. I like to, to use the, um, the, uh, 
the shorthand uh, tagline that there's more muscles in our galaxy now that, or excuse me, there's more muscles in our in our lakes than our stars in a galaxy, because the best estimates are that there's on the order of trillions of muscles in the lakes, and there's only hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy, and that kind of puts it in perspective. What? Wow. Yeah, you can go take a look at uh, some papers on that that back that up. There's on there's there's huge numbers of these muscles on the bottom bottom of our lake. Uh, they found great Whoa. substrate. They 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 replicate like mad, and what folks have, scientists uh, over just a matter of a decade have noticed is that they've dramatically cleared the water. Um, and you think, oh, clear water, isn't that a good thing? Uh, but what that is is they're, they're sucking in the, um, uh, the organic matter in the water that would be food for fish and or is life in and of itself. And so they've rerouted the energy flow in the whole lake systems. Uh, fishermen notice that because fish stocks decline as a result, um, some catastrophically, some uh, indirectly. And people on beaches notice because you had these wash-up um, surges of Clodophora algae, which is this green gunk that kind of washes up on shore because the light's penetrating deeper, so it expands the range that the algae, the macroalgae can grow. And then it, it naturally sloughs off, uh, but there's just a lot more of it. Uh, add some heat to that, and you get issues like in Lake Erie, uh, w with the past five years of, of Toledo having um, microcystin in the water, um, uh, in the water supply, and having to have their their water shut off, um, uh, the, there's a relation between the muscles and that because the muscles um, are um, they selectively do not eat the uh, the microorganisms that generate the, the toxin, and so then they those tend to accumulate and you also tend to get these algal blooms, Lake Erie being a lot shallow. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on that point, but the premise was to take all that interesting dynamical stuff and then put it into a form that kind of gets people general information about the lakes and then encourages them to cooperate in the face of complex environmental economic challenges. Um, and so most people aren't even aware that phytoplankton exists, what it does, that it's in the lakes. And so if you don't, if you're not aware that it exists and that it in the game, it, it becomes this cute, fuzzy thing that you want to protect. Um, if you're not aware of this, <laughs> care that it's being eaten up, eaten up or taken away. So the okay. game is a model for the system in a way that shows us um, that we should, could care about this. And then we used, uh, at my sister's suggestion, these little hair clips with eyeballs to eat the Aww. little fight plankton up. And uh, kids love those. They love to... to do the articulation uh, and eat them up. And then you get to see this really simple equation happening. It's like a health meter if you're thinking of like how healthy are your lakes? Well, you start out with 12 and then they get eaten up and then you spin a wheel and there's a, a random multiplication of how, how rapidly do your simulated muscles uh, reproduce. And pretty soon they're eating up your whole lake. And the rules of the game state that it, if any one lake loses all its muscles, nobody can win. And so that's where if you've heard about the tragedy of the common scenario, the game kind of flips that on its head and says that, okay, if anybody loses, nobody can win. You still want to win, but are we going to accept that, like, one of the Great Lakes would go under from some kind of huge stresses? Is that something that, as a society, we are willing to tolerate? And so no. the game just says, no. You know, like, we're going to say that if anyone loses, nobody can win. And when you start looking at the problems from that perspective, over and above anything that anybody learns about the lakes or about um, aquatic species or invasive species is almost irrelevant compared to that dynamic of, I'm not trying to play this game to wipe you out. I'm trying to play this game so that we all have a chance at winning and that nobody loses. And I think that that's something that there's a lot of interest in in our world um, and that there's a space for kind of retraining our brains. And as I've gone through this yeah. um, process of a lot of playtesting with this game and then sharing it with people, that's one of the interesting things uh, that uh, I think is a takeaway. Uh, anyway, so there's a hundred of those in the world now uh, due to the success of a Kickstarter uh, last year, um, and that's really thrilling. We work with a number of schools who have um, uh, played through that, um, yeah. worked with science curriculum, um, and um, shown a film that kind of just gives them the basics of, of those dynamics. So that's been exciting, and uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, a useful tool. That's pretty wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing both of these um, really cool ideas with us. Um, so again, some takeaways for everybody. 
Um, you don't have to just, there isn't such a thing as a traditional hero. So you, you can try any combination of things in order to make a difference. Um, doing things with apps, doing things with history, doing things with whatever are your passions. Um, and so y'all can see that um, Michael is able to do a lot of cool things to educate people and help them out, um, just relying on what his strengths are. So I encourage y'all to follow him on social media uh, or check out his website. What are those? I know your website. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the portfolio is where I guess I would refer f folks. Um, I'm not the biggest person on Twitter, unfortunately. Uh, I'll have to educate myself on that. Uh, but uh, M -A -Tim, uh, M -A -T -I -M -M com is uh, kind of a portal that you can discover all the assets we're talking about in this conversation. So M -A -T -I -M -M com. And if people want to buy um, the app or buy the game, um, are those, I know you said there's only a hundred copies of this game. Are there going to be further ones available? How can people get, get these things? Yeah. So the app is free and they can download it, uh, through, um, through the tailblazer, uh, if they go to the reflow website. And again, there's a link to that at mhm.com. Um, so reflow is the group that I built that app for and they can access the app for free. It's only really relevant if you're in Milwaukee because it is this place-based uh, place -based game. Uh, however, at the Reflow website, you can see kind of teaser content from all the sites. And so if you're interested in some of those stories, uh, we work with a local journalist who put together some, some great video in addition to some video interviews that I conducted. Um, and so there's a lot to learn about Milwaukee if you go to the Reflow website. That's R-E-F-L-O um, uh, H2O dot uh, com. And um, the game, yeah, Muscle Madness, if there's, if there's folks out there who are really interested, really passionate in another run of this, um, they can reach out to me and we can, we can, we can look into that. Uh, I wanted to put it into the world, and so those 100 are all pretty much spoken for. I've got five that I kind of interact with uh, different teachers or folks in the Milwaukee area who are interested. Uh, but there have been folks at the Alliance for Great Lakes who have copies of the game. There's um, folks um, at different schools in the Milwaukee area who have copies. And then there's folks outside of the area who obtained them through um, interest in their invasive species. There's a guy in Montana, an uh, invasive species center, who obtained one. Uh, so right now it's not something, unfortunately, that you can like get at Amazon. Um, I can't do them on demand. They're kind of too... Um, Mm. Uh, it's too it's too cost prohibitive to do to one offs mm -hmm. of of them, but if there's an entity or institution or a group of individuals who are really excited about this, they can they can reach out and we, and there there's the possibility of doing more downstream. But. That's pretty rad. That's awesome. Well, thank you very very much, um, and thank you everybody, you all for tuning in. <laughs>